All right, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24. Okay, um, we are in the middle of uh, the last week of Jesus on earth. Um, last week, it was about Tuesday in the what we traditionally call um, Passion Week. And uh, we're still in the Tuesday as we pick up in Matthew 24, but you know that Jesus has been having some conversations uh, with the religious. He is um, letting them know the true state of their heart and their hypocrisy. Um, How many know when God exposes the condition of your heart, it is so that you would actually turn and repent? Right? Right. that is his purpose because God is gracious and God is kind. And so if God ever exposes something to you about yourself, it's not so that you can become stubborn and more hardened. It's so that you can come to the realization that that exposing was an act of his grace and you can actually uh, repent and then change directions right? Uh, And change the course of your life. And so um, that is what I think Jesus was attempting to do. And yet what actually happens um, is that the religious become more hardened. They don't, they don't repent. Um, They become more hardened. It's interesting sometimes the reason why um, people will say they love our church and sometimes one of the answers that we constantly get is, hey, we just love that you guys um, unapologetically preach the word. And, and that, is, that is an honor. Um, it scares me to preach the word, even to preach tonight's text. I was having a conversation with Pastor Jason today, and I said a lot of uh, pastors and preachers can come up uh, to the pulpit with this text and preach with great confidence. I cannot. I can't. Um, and that is not because of a lack of study or preparation. Uh, that is probably because of all the time of study and preparation that I realize how heavy of a text this is. And so one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is that handling certain um, scriptures and texts. Um, and yet, I think, you know, some people go to different churches for, hey, uh, they preach the word of God, but there are also other people who look for churches uh, who don't necessarily preach the word of God so intensely. Um, people actually, believe it or not, look for churches um, who are a little bit more soft, in their, in their approach, it's, it's a little bit more watered down. It's, it's, it's more palatable. And um, someone said, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and it, it makes for a good listening experience. You know what I mean? Um, but it does no good for your soul and your state for eternity. Right? And so don't settle for a good listening experience and then neglect your eternal future. You know what I mean? Um, and so I try to approach the word of God with, with that in, in mind. Now, we're talking about the end of the age. We're talking about the signs of the time. And really, this is part one. Next week, we're going to have part two because I'm not going to make it through all of this chapter uh, tonight. And so um, we're going to focus on Verses 1 to about 35, if we get there, let's see uh, what the Lord has for us tonight. Um, But I think it's important because some of us um, hardly think about the end. When we think of Christianity, when we think of our relationship with Jesus, when we think of even just life, um, when you plan out, when you think of the future, some of us, we hardly think that there is an end and Jesus is coming back. Uh, We think graduation, we think uh, that promotion, we think that job, we think think that career, we think that relationship, we think the the marriage, the house, the kit, right? We think retirement. And, And some of us, we hardly think about the end. And so that's why it's so important that we don't skip over texts and chapters like tonight. And that's one of the beauties of going through the gospel verse by verse, going through the gospel of Matthew verse by verse, because it allows you to listen to scriptures you would otherwise skip. 
and it allows me to preach scriptures I otherwise would script, uh, skip. Hello? Because I got news for you, uh, you're not the only one who skips scriptures. Preachers and pastors also skip scriptures. I'm just gonna pick up my own kind for a moment. You know what I mean? Um, and I would be a liar to stand up here and say that we don't think about what you want to hear. Hello? We're honest tonight. Is that okay? And so it's important for us to do that. Why? One of the main reasons why it's so important for us to talk about the signs of the times, the end of the age, and all the things that follow is because we have to ask the question, and it is a, it is a legitimate question. It is a question of discipleship. It, and the question is, what does it look like for you to follow Jesus during difficult times? You, you have to think about that before difficult times actually come your way. What does it look like for you? Now, I could say, what does it look like for us? But, but you're living a different life than I'm living. So in your context, the relationships you have, the life that God has given you, what does it look like for you to follow Jesus during difficult times? What do you have to say yes to, and what are you going to have to say no to? And so it's important for us to not skip over and gloss over chapters like this and, and portions of scriptures like this, and we can't treat these moments like, yeah, I don't really need to know about this. No, we, we do because it informs our discipleship journey. How are we doing so far? Right? And so that's number one. Number two is the way we approach it. So, one, we cannot approach it nonchalantly, right? We cannot approach it with no importance. And yet on the flip side, I think there is an approach to chapters like this and scriptures like this in the Bible uh, where um, people completely ignore the context and they take the meaning to mean something completely prophetic and totally in the future. And they forget that Jesus is actually talking to individuals in a particular context and setting. Hello? And so I've heard preachers talk about Matthew 24 and they have never once mentioned the disciples Jesus is actually talking to. And somehow Russia is involved and China is involved. You know what I mean? And, and it's like, wait, hold on. What happened to the context of this scripture? And so that's incredibly important because I think we have, and for a long time, humanity has been obsessed with the future, and we still are. We're obsessed with the future. As I, people go to different things uh, outside of the Christian space, people go to palm readers. Yeah. Hello? And all sorts of nonsense. Why? Because they're obsessed about the future. In, in our sphere, people go chasing after quote unquote prophets. Tell them, give me a word about my future. Because we're obsessed with our future. And I think part of the reason why we're so obsessed with the future is because we fail in our day to day obedience to Jesus. And so when your day-to-day -day relationship with Jesus is not fruitful, and it is, can I say, not joyful, you're not actually enjoying the treasure that Jesus is on a day-to-day -day basis, you will always look for something in the future to satisfy. And so you'll go and try to find that in all the wrong places. Hello? Have you ever wondered why in the Christian sphere, uh, those men with the largest platforms who call themselves prophets are doing so well? Why? Because somebody is feeding their pockets. Why? Because people are obsessed with the future. You see that? And so we have to be incredibly careful and we have to allow the word of God to remain the word of God and when it comes to issues that we do not understand and we don't have a total grip on, hey, ladies and gentlemen, it is okay to say I don't know, which I will be saying a lot tonight. <laughs> so, um, Matthew 24, but let's pick it up in Matthew 23, 
37 to 39, because it'll give context to where we're heading in this chapter. Why don't we stand tonight? How are we doing so far? Good. All right. So we'll start at Matthew 23, 37 to 39, and then we'll go into uh, chapter 24, and we'll take it one moment at a time. Okay. Verse 37 of 23 says this. It says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. So remember, Jesus is talking to them, to the religious, saying, hey, God continues to send you prophets. Remember the parable he talked about of, of the owner of the vineyard who, who would send his servants and they kept killing his servants. So, so, so he finally sent his son and they killed his son. Yeah, so he's talking, he's talking about about them, you, you kill the prophet, you kill the prophets, you stone those who are sent. How often I would have gathered your children together as hens under her brood, under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house, which could represent both Israel and the temple, is left to you in desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so the first entry, they they said that when Jesus entered the gates of Jerusalem, they said, Hosanna. And the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? It's a quote out of what they would have called for David. And so um, he's saying, hey, when I come back again, you're going to say this. So right there, Jesus is again telling them, I'm going. Matthew 24, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to a point to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Now, I've got a picture for you I want to show you very quickly of the temple. If we could just throw that up, Lou. Um, Okay, so you see that behind me? So you can see this is now, this, uh, during the time of Jesus, most of this would have been built. Herod um, actually assisted in the further development of this temple. Um, you see that building on the left? That's where Jesus probably would have overturned all the temples or all, all the tables. And so you can see uh, this thing is magnificent. It's huge, right? And we're going to talk in a little while even of how, how massive some of the stones were. And so the disciples... Jesus is just talking about their houses in desolate. And the disciples go, but Jesus, now the, now the disciples were actually, they're, they're farmers, if you will. They're, they're fishermen and they're farmers. They're not from the city, That's right. right? It's not every day they're in this temple. They're in synagogues and other places. It's not every day they're in the temple of Jerusalem. And so they are amazed. Whoa, this is a beautiful building. So let's pick it back up in verse 2 or verse one, going away when his disciples came to a point, uh, point out to him the buildings of the temple. Jesus, look at these buildings. What are you talking about? These are gonna be destroyed. These look incredibly beautiful. They're magnificent. They're huge. But he answered, "Uh, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Whoa. Whoa. And you saw how massive and magnificent that temple was. And Jesus says, yeah, all of this is going to be destroyed. And so you could only imagine their reaction, right? You could imagine their hearts sinking to their stomachs. What? So then Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. He sat on the Mount of Olives and his disciples came to him uh, privately saying, tell us, when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. So, so how many questions are they asking Jesus? All right. There's two questions in there. One, when will these things happen? What are these things? The destruction. Right? So he's just talked about the temple's going to be destroyed. So when will these things happen, Jesus? Question number two, what's going to be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So two questions, and Jesus is now going to answer them. So let's pray, and then we'll get into that. Father, we thank you for this time together in your presence. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. We thank you for your word. It is eternal, it is everlasting, and it is life-giving. 
Uh, God, even as we endeavor to jump into these words that you have spoken, uh, give us wisdom, give us discernment. Uh, let us put uh, any of our um, uh, thoughts and emotions that might sway us from understanding your word correctly tonight. Let us move away from those things. Let us present ourselves to you holy and blameless, ready to learn from you as you prepare us, Lord, for the end. As you prepare us for difficult times, continue to mold us, continue to shape us for your glory. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for the warm weather that is coming. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You can say hi to somebody if you haven't already. All right, so you notice here in verse three, he sits on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came up to him privately. So remember we talked about his, his last public message was the woes, the seven woes that he gave to uh, the religious leaders in the temple. He gave all these woes to them because he was exposing their hypocrisy. Part of the reason he's uh, exposing their hypocrisy is one, so that they can ultimately repent. But two, it is also to help um, the people of that day to stop putting so much hope and so much confidence in the scribes and the Pharisees. Remember we talked about the oral law that they came up with and, and that oral law began to be treated as God's word even though it wasn't, right? And so they were putting total dependence on their words rather than total dependence on God's words, all right? And so he exposes their hypocrisy. And so he does that publicly, but now he's going to spend some time with his disciples. And so he's on the Mount of Olives, talking to them privately. Tell us when these things will be. So question number one. Tell us when these things will be. And we've already talked about uh, these things me being the destruction of the temple. All right? Question number two. And, he says, they say, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end, end of the age? So they want to know when these things are going to be and what are going to be the signs of the coming of Jesus and of the end of the age. All right, so let's go through this and have some fun. So Jesus responds, verse 4, and uh, he answers them. He says, hey, see, now watch this, watch this, watch this, okay. Isn't it interesting that the first response Jesus gives, okay, this is very fascinating, has to do with being led astray. He, I love Jesus because Jesus doesn't give straightforward answers. You notice that? Yeah. He, they go, hey, when are these things going to happen and when are you going to come back and what's that all going to look like? And he goes, hey, number one, make sure you're not led astray. Now, why is that? Because so many people have so many opinions. Hello, have you noticed that? I dare you, and actually don't do this because it would be incredibly unhealthy. I dare you to just go search on the internet um, the return of Jesus and what that will look like and you will get a plethora of inconsistent responses. Just go on YouTube and you're gonna find nuts and crazies <laughs> telling you all sorts of things. Hello? And so, talking about the second coming of Christ, See that no one leads you astray. Now, uh, uh, some of you have grown up, um, you, you've, been, you've been alive long enough to see all the fools come on television and on radio and broadcast, hey, this is when Jesus is coming back. Some of you, you, some of you have lived through, through that. And so I did some digging and I found some hilarious stuff out about people uh, predicting the return of, of Jesus um, there's one, I think, in 1942, 1943, around that time, where this guy began to talk about the return of Jesus being around that time. And, and guess what people started to do? People started to quit their jobs. People started to sell their possessions. Um, everything, they got rid of all these things. And guess what? Jesus never came. Yeah. Right, uh, And then I think one of the other bigger ones, and some of you may, uh, I don't know if you remember this, in, in 1988, there was a gentleman who came out with a book uh, that was called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. Yeah. And, uh, and he was wrong. He wasn't wrong once, he was wrong 88 times. 
yeah. And so guess, guess what he did? Uh, the following year, he released another book called 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1989. Um, I don't think he came out with a book after that. Um, so many different people. I'm sure you've lived through even the, mo- the, or even the series Left Behind, right? Um, and all sorts of things ar- around that. Uh, subject of, of Jesus coming back and, uh, and what will that look like and, and uh, uh, you know um, people that I, I, I think there's even this one, one scene where this guy's in the washroom and he's shaving and his wife comes looking for him and, uh, and he disappears and there's the shaver just shaking on the counter because he's gone now he's been uh, right um, extra pilots and airplanes because if one gets raptured at least then there's another one in there um, all sorts of things right that um, people uh, say, believe, have said, because people are obsessed with um, the details. And we're going to find out tonight that Jesus doesn't care so much about the details. Um, one of the other things we're going to find out tonight is this chapter actually does not endorse the rapture. And we're going to talk about that a little bit um, as well. And so he says, see that no one leads you astray because there's so many different people with so many different opinions. There's one opinion that matters and it's the opinion of Jesus. Amen? Amen. That was a good spot for an amen. For many will come, notice, in my name. So people are going to come and they're going to say, hey, I represent Jesus. They're going to come in my name, Jesus says Right, and, and we can go e- e- e through church history. We can go even today to look at the different amounts of ministries and, and men and women that say they're representing Jesus, but they're leading many astray of how many uh, witnesses and testimonies have come out of, 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 of mega movements and large churches that have exposed the secrets behind the scenes that you and I never hear about, but we're in love and infatuated with the man or the woman standing on the platform holding the mic. And yet they're leading uh, many astray, and, and, and a lot of these ministries actually operate more like cults. And so many people are going to come in my name, Jesus says, saying, hey, I'm the Christ. And this, this word is, they're not going to say, I'm Jesus, the, the, I'm the Christ is the Messiah. Right? In other words, I'm the second coming. Now, I don't have time to delve into this, but it would be an interesting study for you to do even on yourself, uh, even for yourself, that uh, in in Islam, their Messiah description is our Antichrist description. And so you could do that on your own. We would have to take a lot of time to delve into that. But if you were ever curious to study that, uh, their Messiah's description is our Antichrist description. Um, and they will lead, notice there it is again, many astray. So here he says astray twice. So clearly he is wanting his disciples to stay on the narrow path. Amen. Right? Yeah. Well, God said to Joshua, keep my words in your mouth day and night, meditate on them. Do not look to the left or to the right. Amen. Don't be led. Don't be led astray. Verse 6. I think my iPad's having issues here. Verse six. Okay. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And here's his, here's his command in the midst of this. Now, this is, what, this, is what, this is what I want you to see. Jesus does not care about the details. You and I, we want to know the exacts. Hey, when's Jesus coming? When's this happening? Right? We want to know the exacts. And yet, what we're going to see in the responses of Jesus, as he's, giving, as he's giving some allusions to the signs and the things that might happen and, and will occur, uh, sorry, not might, but will occur and will happen, uh, in the midst of it, what he's really going to be instilling in them are the kinds of people he expects them to be. Right. Number one, people who are not led astray. Number two, people who are not alarmed. Right? And so you and I, here's the expectation. Jesus expects us in the midst of calamity, in the midst of wars, in the midst of rumors of wars, in the midst of everything that is happening. Oh no, the world is ending. Here are you and I standing firm on the word of Jesus, not shaken because our hope is in him. That's his expectation. 
Hey, don't be alarmed. So the next time somebody comes up to you and says, hey, have you heard of this war? It's crazy what's happening. What if it comes here to North America? Your response? I'm not alarmed. And, <laughs> and you watch the worldly lose their minds around you. And I'm not just talking, when I say worldly, I don't even mean non-believers. I mean those in the church who are obsessed with things that cause fear. And Jesus goes, no, 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 your attitude, you're not alarmed. You're not alarmed. Uh, not because you are ignorant to what is happening, right? But because Jesus told you this will happen. Look at what he says. For this must take place, right? It must take place. So Jesus has already told you, here's what's going to happen. You got the newspaper before the date. You understand? And so you don't have a reason to be alarmed because now you go, no, my master, my savior, the anchor of my soul told me this was going to happen. And, and he holds history in his hands. So I'm not alarmed. And so he says, for this reason, don't be alarmed. Uh, why? Because uh, the end is not yet. And so this is, this is interesting, right? He goes, hey, it's going to look like the end, but it's the end before the end. The end is not, the end is not yet. And so don't be alarmed. This is not the end. Now, what does he say? He says, here's what's going to happen for nation will rise against nation, right? Uh, kingdom against kingdom. There will be, notice, famine and earthquakes in various places. And then he says, all these things, right? What are they? They're the beginning of birth pains. It's the end of before the end. Don't get deceived. Don't be alarmed. It's going to look like the world is ending, but it's not. These are just the beginning of the birth pains. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, hey, it's actually going to get worse before it gets better. Now, this is very interesting for you and I because we live in a world that is obsessed with getting the best now because what awaits them in the future is nothing but tragedy. And you and I can endure this life even if we don't get the best now because we know what awaits us is eternity with God. And so we endure because we know our future is secure. Come on, how good is that? So he says, all these are but the beginning of birth pains. In other words, it will get better before it gets worse. Now, 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 here's the beauty of birth pains. Birth pains ultimately lead to birth in other words, Jesus is saying, hey, there is something new coming. There is new life that awaits my disciples. Right? So another, another way to see this, because how many know nation has been uh, rising against nation, kingdom has been rising against kingdom? How many know there's been famines, there have been earthquakes since the beginning of time? Yeah. Right? And so what is, what is that tell us that a lot of times people have this um, tendency to look at the calamities that are happening in the, in the world and automatically assume that with the second coming. And he's saying, no, no, no. The earth actually is a place where there is evil. It's a, it's a place where terrible things happen. Whether those terrible things are natural, like earthquakes, or they are done by people to other people. And so uh, don't think it's the end. You're just going through life and what you're experiencing is the brokenness of this world. Now, I love what C.S. Lewis talks about when he talks about um, the beauty of pain, the beauty of pain, the beauty of pain. Um, Pain is an indication, pain is an indication that you're actually not supposed to feel this. Right? 
Pain is an indication that something is wrong, meaning this is not how it's supposed to be. And so one of the beautiful things that C.S. Lewis talks about is that the pain and the suffering and the brokenness we see and observe in this world and internally and innately, we know this is wrong. We know this is not right. He goes, there's two reasons for that. One, it's because there was a better world that existed before us. Two, we know that there's a better world that is going to exist after this. And so it is both this this uh, memory of the past, and yet it is this longing for the future that God has instilled in the human soul. How good is that? All these things are the beginning of the birth of the birth pains, and so something new is coming. New life awaits my disciples. Now, he said it's going to get worse before it gets better, right? So he says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation, and they're going to put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations, notice, for my name's sake. So he's talking to his disciples. You're going to be hated because you're following me. Now, you study the book of Acts, you study church history, you see the words of Jesus come to pass. That the disciples of Jesus throughout church history, including the ones he's talking to on the mount right now, are handed over to tribulation, persecution, and ultimately to death because of their love for Jesus. And then he says, here's what's going to happen. Many are also going to fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And so you're going to have persecution, but you're also going to have betrayal. And so not only are you going to experience persecution for my name's sake, you're going to experience um, hatred and betrayal from other people. Not only that, that's not, that's not where it's going to stop. If you thought that was bad enough, here's what's going to happen. Verse 11, there is going to be many false prophets who's, who are going to arise. And guess, guess what? Not only are they going to arise, they're actually going to lead many astray. And so you're going to have persecution, you're going to have betrayal, and you're going to have deception. And guess what? Verse 12 says, and because lawlessness will increase, wickedness will increase, guess what? Love of many will grow cold. Because lawlessness is going to increase. So you're going to have persecution, you're going to have betrayal, you're going to have deception, and sin is going to increase, love is going to decrease. If you study the book of Acts, you study the early church, you can see all these things to be true. In fact, if you just look at the world around you, you can see these things to be true. Right? Um, so then what? What do, you, what do you do? How do you, what is his word in the midst of these details to the disciples? We, we heard of two already. One, don't be astray. Don't be led astray. Uh, two, do not be alarmed. What is his word in this? He says, verse 13, but the one who endures to the end, notice, will be saved. So what is the solution to the persecution, to the betrayal, to the deception, to the increase of sin, to the decrease of love? What is the solution for his disciples? They are to stand firm. To stand from the one who endures to the end, the one who in the end still loves God and still loves neighbor, for these are the two greatest commandments, now, you know what I love about this verse? It's comforting. It's comforting. Because it says, he, he, what he doesn't say is um, um, the one who has the largest ministry at the end. The, the one who has the largest following at the end. That's not what it says. It says the one who will endure. You know that word, endure? Another translation of that word is the one who's still hanging on. <laughs> Isn't that comforting? That if you just hang on in the midst of the stuff that the world throws at you, God says you will be saved. Just hang on. Right? And what are we hanging on to? Not the opinions of people. We're hanging on to Jesus. Amen. That is a comforting 
word. And if you just stay close to him, you just stand by him, stand firm and hang on, you will be saved. Right? Okay. Now, um, this is where things get a little funny and interesting. In verse 15, he goes in to talk about the abomination of the desolation. Um, and so he says, so, he, so, so let's go back for a moment. Um, he, gives, he gives all these details of what's the first question they're asking. Right? When will these things happen? What are the, these things that they're talking about? The destruction of the temple, right? And so he's answering the first question. He answered the, he's answering the first question. So as he's in the middle of answering the first question, he says, so when you see, so when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken by, he says, the prophet Daniel, right? Standing in the holy place. Let, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, now, um, he says something very interesting. Now, I don't know if in, in your Bible you have brackets in verse 15 that says, let the reader understand. See that? Um, now, I don't think while Jesus is talking to his disciples, he turns aside and looks at the camera and says, let the reader understand, and then goes back to talking to his disciples. I think what's put in the brackets is put there by Matthew as he's writing this. He wants his readers to understand the book and the prophetic literature of Daniel, right? So he says, hey, dear reader, make sure you understand what Daniel says. Mark actually uses the same language when he's talking about this. He says, hey, dear reader, let, make sure you understand what Daniel talks about. Now, if you've ever read the book of Daniel, um, you're most likely not going to come out of there with like 100% understanding, right? Because it is apocalyptic. Yeah. He has visions and dreams that uh, you kind of have to decipher a little bit uh, to try to make sense of. And so he says, make sure you understand um, Daniel. So what do we know about Daniel? Well, we know it is prophetic, Right, uh, we know Daniel is in the midst of a culture um, that is anti the God of Israel. Right, um, we know that he's dealing with a Babylonian society. We know that when he writes, he's writing apocalyptic literature, which which has nuances in the way you understand it, because it's not as clear cut as the Book of Proverbs, for instance. Because the book of Proverbs is wisdom literature. Very clear to understand. If you do this, this will happen. If, right? If you do that, that will happen. And so that's, that's what we know of the book of Daniel. And so, and so what does that tell you and I? What we're about to read next, the words of Jesus, we have to do with the same lens that we would have as we read the book of Daniel. Does that make sense? Right? So let's not convolute it. Let's not throw Russia into the equation and China into, and helicopters and nukes. Let's not, let's not do that. Right? Um, because that's not what his disciples were thinking. Right? Okay. Um, man, I wish I had more time tonight. Okay. Uh, I, think we'll, I, think we'll get, I think we'll get to this. Okay. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, uh, let the reader understand um, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Where is Judea? Yes. So let the one who is on his housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his clothes. And alas, or your, your translation might, be, might say, uh, woe uh, to women who are pregnant and to who those uh, who are nursing infants during those days. Pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for there will be great tribulation such as has not been seen from the beginning of the world until now, and no one ever will see. Um, and no, 
and ever, never will be. So he's talking to them about a time of tribulation that is going to be so severe, that is going to be so extreme, um, that if you're in the middle of doing a task and it's cold outside, forget your coat. Run to the mountains. And the mountains represent a place of refuge. They always have. Right? Um, we can go into talk about the righteous running into the Mount of Zion. So many different, so many different variations. We can talk about David's uh, Psalms, re- the mountain representing a place of refuge, right? Um, and so the mountains always represent this place of security. And he says, the times are going to get so bad, so rough, uh, that your response isn't stay and fight. Your response is run. Now, here is the question, okay? Uh, remember I said, I, I, I'm going to come to you with a lot of I don't knows? Yeah, this is where it begins, right? So people look at this and they go, okay, uh, what is Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about what we now understand as the seven-year uh, uh, period of the tribulation, um, where the world is going to get filled with evil, right? It's going to get so anti-God, that's what Jesus is talking about here. Um, and then I would say, I would say, slow down. Right? Now, do we have other scriptures that could give us an understanding of a period of tribulation that's going to come? Hello? Right? And that's going to uh, uh, fill the earth with evil and wickedness and great persecution? We do. Absolutely. We go, we go to Revelation. We can go to Thessalonians, right? We can go to other different texts that, that support that. And so we can tie those strings here. But here's what I would say to you. If you tie those strings, tie them loosely. Okay? Um, because here's what you and I are guilty of. You and I are guilty as it relates to Bible reading. We jump over the immediate context. And we want to know what God has to say for us today because we are self-absorbed. And that's just the truth. The first person we want to know how a Bible passage affects is us. Well, how does this affect me? You go to Bible study, what do they ask? Hey, so what are your thoughts on this scripture? What, is this, what does this passage mean to you? Hey, I don't care what it means to you. And no offense. I want to know what it meant to Jesus, the author. I want to know what it meant to his original audience. And when I get a good grip on that, I can begin to explore. That's healthy Bible study. Are you with me? And so, um, <laughs> okay, immediately after the tribulation, um, He says, oh, sorry, we're not even there yet. I'm moving ahead too fast. So when you see this, the abomination of desolation. Now, if if you want to take notes, there is some cross-references that Jesus probably had in mind as he was saying uh, these things. And so the, the abomination of desolation that he's referring to here, you can find in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, Daniel talks about um, this. Um, now, this is, this, this is interesting because he talks about this um, week-long period uh, where a ruler will emerge, right? And halfway through the week, he is going to cause this abomination. Now, if you, read the, if you read the book of Daniel and you understand the original language, um, some Bibles will translate that week to the original language because in the original language, it's actually the word seven. And, and if you have a good enough Bible, it might have a footnote there for you to tell you um, it, the original word is seven. So there will be a period of seven, right? And halfway in that period, there's going to be somebody who emerges who's going to cause this abomination, which is why we get the seven-year tribulation. You with me? Are we doing okay? 
it's, 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 a, it's a lot of stuff, but I want to give you, I want to give you some of that so you understand, um, you understand where even Jesus's mind would have been as he writes this. So, uh, he says, he says, um, what's going to be the sign? Right? Um, what is going to be the sign during this time uh, for you? It's when you see this. When you see the abomination of desolation. Now, here's the question. What is that? What is the abomination of desolation? Right? Yeah, it could be the Antichrist. Um, that's one interpretation. Uh, it could be when um, the whole world turns against Israel. Um, there's a few different uh, future understandings of it. Um, but what did Jesus mean when he spoke to them? Now, remember, what question is he answering? When will these things happen? And what are these things? The destruction of the temple. Okay, that's important. Um, so when you see this, it's going to be a sign to you uh, that these things are happening. Okay. So, um, I'm trying to decipher where to go because there's so many different places. Okay, let's run through this and then I'll make, I'll make that comment. Um, okay, you know what? I'll do it here. I'll do it here. Um, okay, so remember I, Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple, correct? And so when, when you and I, we approach this, we approach this text, um, we kind of, we kind of, we kind of get rid of the, even the imagery and the understanding that Jesus is answering a literal question. Is he not? Yeah. yeah. We skip over that part and we immediately go, Hey, what is this going to mean during our lifetime? We go right into the details, right? Now, um, I want you to understand, now I showed you a picture of the temple, right? I want you to understand how severe the destruction of the temple was when it happened. So um, Jesus talks about, he's answering the question to um, the destruction of the temple, correct? And so he begins to say, hey, this, this is the abomination of desolation spoken uh, of by the prophet in, in Daniel, standing in the holy place. Um, and here's what's going to happen. Uh, it's going to be so bad that you're going to have to, if you're in, in Judea, you're going to have to flee to the mountains. If you're on the housetop, because the housetops in Israel were flat, they're not like our housetops, right? There's no reason for you to be on your housetop um, unless you're putting Christmas lights or something, I don't know. Um, but our housetops are not made for going up there and chilling. You know what I mean? Uh, some of you come from warmer climates where you know what I'm talking about, of a flat rooftop. And so if you're there, um, go. Forget your cloak. Who's this going to be tough for? It's going to be tough for women who are pregnant, who are nursing. It's going to be tough during the winter. Now, what is Jesus talking about? If he's talking about totally, if he's only talking about the future, future. Well, who cares if the, who cares if the Antichrist shows up in the winter or the Sabbath? Right? And so, because the Sabbath was a day of rest. Somebody asked the question, what does the Sabbath have to do? The Sabbath is a day of rest. The Sabbath is a day of no preparation. You wouldn't prep on the day of Sabbath. You would prep for the day of Sabbath. And so if something happened on the day of Sabbath that you were not prepared for, guess what? You don't have the means to survive. You understand? Does that make sense? So, he says, um, this is going to be tough. For then, verse 21, let me see if I can pull it up here. For then, if I can find it in the midst of these 35 verses in my iPad. For then, for then, for then, there will be great tribulation. Right? Uh, such as has not been seen from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. Now, 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 now. Here's the question. 
if, this, if Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple, then, then what is this sentence? That it's going to be so great, you've never seen it even from the beginning of the world until now, and you never will. Now, here's what you have to understand. Rabbis use what is called hyperbole. It is an exaggerated method of speech to make their point. Okay? I can go into 20 different examples of Jesus doing this. Right? We could talk about ripping or cutting the hand off. Right? Um, we can talk about pulling the eye out. Uh, we can talk about hating your brother, and that's murder. You've killed him. And so this was a means to teach disciples a specific point. And so it was hyperbole, right, to make a point. Now, if you go into the Old Testament, you're going to find that there was no king ever before or in the future like King Josiah. That's what the Bible says. There's never been a king like him, and there will never be a king like him again. Well, until Hezekiah shows up. And then the Bible says there was never a king like him, and there will never be a king like him again. Right? And so what, what, is, what does that mean? It's saying, it's emphasizing, this is the greatest king we've had to date. It's, it's making a point. When you, when you go out somewhere and you go, man, that was the best burger I've ever had. You know what I mean? Until you go to a new burger joint. And you go, that was the best. You know what I'm saying? And so, and so we, have to understand, we have to understand that. Now, I say that to say, when I begin to tell you about the destruction of the temple, you will understand what Jesus is saying here. Because the destruction of the temple, because you and I in North America, as we read the Bible, we go, who cares about who Jesus is talking to? Let's just make it about us. But the destruction of the temple was an evil and wicked thing that Jerusalem or that Israel had never faced before. And so uh, here's here's um, what happens. He says uh, these these guys. Um, he goes, it's going to happen, and uh, it's going to be terrible. In verse twenty two. Um, and those day, if those days had not been cut short, no human being would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says, look, here is Christ or there is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. And so there's that deception again, right? And so they're going to say, hey, look, um, I told you before. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out there. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them, right? For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the man. And then he begins to go into the second question, which was, when will you come back? And what will that look like? Now, let's go back to the great tribulation of the temple. So Jesus says this. And approximately 40 years later, the temple is destroyed. Now, what's crazy and later, later on is Jesus, Jesus says, hey, I tell you that this generation will not pass away until these things happen. Do you know what the number for a generation in the Bible is? 40 years. And approximately 40 years later, the temple that Jesus predicts will be destroyed is destroyed. Israel goes to war with the Romans. It's a four-year war. You can read about it and learn fascinating things. Um, a Roman, uh, the Romans are led by a general named Titus. And they completely demolish Israel. Destroy Israel, destroy the temple. In fact, they even came into the temple, set up their own gods, and made pig sacrifices. Pig sacrifices because pigs were unclean. Um, let me show you two very quick pictures. One is um, the Arch of Titus. Uh, and the second one uh, you'll see is, is, is even an engraving in there that highlights. So this is the Arch of Titus. You see that behind me? 
And in there are all uh, these engravings highlighting who Titus is. And one of the things was when they invaded the temple and destroyed Rome. And you could see them taking all the things out. Now, let me tell you how wicked and, 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 and bad these days were. These days were so bad uh, that history records certain Israelites resulting to cannibalism just to keep themselves alive. Having to eat your children. And I wonder if they would have thought there has never come a day like this before. And there will never come a day like this again. This is wicked. And they would flee for their uh, safety. And so um, what's interesting uh, about this is that we can see that this was such a horrifying event. Let me read from a commentator. He says it was virtually a bloodbath of Jewish men and women who were pummeled by the Roman army. The Jewish historian uh, Josephus even described the savagery, slaughter, disease, and the famine that marked the Jewish people during those years. Um, here it is. Parents resor- res- resorted to cannibalism with their own children, and many Jews were taken into slavery. The death toll was in the millions. And this took place about 40 years after the words of Jesus to his disciples. Where Jesus says, don't even go into your homes, flee. Don't fight, flee. And so you see uh, the terrible evil Um, that was the destruction of the temple, right? And then in verse 25, Jesus says something very interesting. He says, see, I have told you beforehand. See, I have told you beforehand. I've already warned you of what is to come. And here's the truth, church. History is in God's hands. It really is. It really is. And so, I think we're almost out of time, so let me close with some thoughts, and we're done. How are we doing? We good? Um, Let me say this. Um, Matthew says, hey, dear reader, understand the book of Daniel. Um, in the next couple of verses, Jesus begins to, to quote uh, from Isaiah. He quotes again um, from Daniel. Isaiah is a prophet, but he's also a poet. Um, Daniel is a leader, but he's also a prophet. And um, what we have to understand is when it comes to scriptures like this, there is a level of duality. Sometimes it's not this or that. Sometimes it's this and that. And so even in the writings of Daniel, Daniel is dealing with the Babylonian empire um, and he talks about seeing visions of beasts And so even Daniel, as he's giving these prophetic words and he's talking about these dreams and he's asking angels to come interpret them, he's dealing with an immediate context. And yet, hundreds of years later, we can see that it also means something else. If you begin to study even the Old Testament prophets, you study even the messianic scriptures of Old Testament, you'll understand that they have an immediate context. And yet... They point forward to the coming of Jesus. We can go into the Psalms, which talks about the king who will have an everlasting throne. And in their immediate context, they would have understand, they would have understood that to mean David, and yet we know that it is future pointing to the Messiah, who is Jesus. And so even these words, yes, they have to do with the destruction of the temple, and yet there's a duality right? 
And the reason that I wanted to spend most of tonight talking about the immediate context is because we're so quick to jump over it that we don't understand that Jesus was actually talking to literal people and that there is a great calamity that they went through in 70 AD that was total horror. But we just want to go to, well, what does this mean for me? And yet there's context, there's a speaker, there's an audience, right? Remember, I've taught you this is when, it comes to, when it comes to Bible reading. Anytime you read the Bible, you're having a cross-cultural experience. You're jumping into their timeline and their space and their setting. So you have to understand that first, and then you have to build bridges that eventually lead you to application. And so there's a, there's a, there's a duality, right? There's a duality. And so let me... Let me just make some closing um, remarks and then next week we're going to do part two of this because this was fun, at least for me. So uh, just to recap even what we said, um, why is it important? Um, Because we need to know what it looks like to faithfully follow Jesus during difficult times. Right? Um, We cannot be so obsessed with the future that we neglect the day-to-day journey of following Jesus. Now, here's what I want you to know. Um, What Jesus was giving them, he, he, he was not giving them clues to create a specific timeline. And that's what we do. We go, give me a specific timeline. And what do we do? We scour the Bible and we go, hey, this text means that text and this connects to this text. And if, and, and, and this means, this means a thousand years from then. And this means a thousand years from now. And, and we create this timeline, don't we? Um, and, and if I could just jump forward just for a moment. I love what Jesus, um, what Jesus says. If I can find the scripture. Uh, Verse 36, it's not here, just listen to it. Um, Verse 36, he says, but concerning that day and hour, um, no one knows. No one knows. He goes, in fact, um, I don't even know. Only the Father knows. <laughs> right? Like, what more does Jesus have to say to us to go, hey, don't obsess over the details? If you want to obsess over one thing, it's, hey, are you still hanging on? Are you becoming like me? Am I forming you into the disciple that can look at tribulation in its face and not be alarmed? Are you becoming those kinds of disciples? Now, let me say this. Discipleship involves learning. Did you know that? (laughs) The word disciple in the Greek is mathetes, which is where they get the word math. Right? Another translation of that word is student and learner. And so you're constantly learning. That's what discipleship is. So how do you know if you're faithfully following Jesus? Are you faithfully learning from him? And if you're not, then you're not. And if you are, then you are. And it's just as simple as that. And part of that learning as we disciple after Jesus has to do with learning what to hold loosely and what to hold tightly. And you cannot hold everything tightly just like you cannot hold everything loosely. 
part of discipleship is learning what to hold on tightly to and what to hold on loosely to. And so issues of even this scripture of, of the nuances and the overlaps of, well, what is, when does he actually cross over to our future and when is he talking about their future? And what does this mean and how does, and the time, hold those loosely, church. Hold those loosely. You want to know what to hold on tightly to? The one who endures to the end will be saved. Hold tightly to that. Hold tightly to that. Um, here's what we can learn even out of this text. Number one, the things of this world are passing and they will pass. Not even one stone will be left upon another. Did you see how magnificent the temple was? What does that tell me? Not even the best things in this world will remain. Everything will pass. Number two, he said, my word will never. So the truth of his word is permanent. Do you hear me? It's permanent. It's not fickle. It is permanent. Jesus accurately depicted the destruction of Jerusalem and it happened 40 years from his prediction. You know what else he predicted? His death and resurrection. And those things happened. You know what else he predicted? His return. And can I tell you, based on his track record, he will return. He will. He will return. And so our hope is in Jesus. It will always be in Jesus. We are not to fear his return because of the calamities that will come before. No, no, no. We are to hope for his return. We're to hope for his return. On Sunday, I'm going to talk a little bit about anxiety and prayer. And one of the things that causes people to be so anxious is death. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about death from a Christian scholar is this, for a Christian, death becomes a servant that holds open the door into glory. What? <laughs> Death isn't the master of all fears over your life. No, no, no. Death is the servant who will open the door to welcome you into glory. How good is that? And so we hope and long for the return of Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you for these moments that we had in your presence. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you honestly and openly. And Jesus, we thank you that we can come to you as learners. You are our rabbi. You're our teacher. And we know that you're so much more than that. You're our Lord, you're our God, you're our savior. But we thank you, Lord, that you journey with us and you walk at our pace so that we don't miss you. And so Father, let each and every one of us here tonight and those listening and watching God, be shaped into followers of Jesus who can look at pain and trouble and tribulation and be unalarmed. That we would be so deeply rooted in your love and the reality of who you are and your word that we will not be swayed to the left or to the right for we will know our God. And that we will look forward to your return. We thank you for your authority that is evident through your scripture and through human history, and it will be evident for future and eternity to come. Let us rest in that authority now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching. 
We really appreciate your time. Will you please like and subscribe so that you will get notifications? And by the way, your comments and your feedback are very important to us. Even sermon series and messages that you would like to hear about, please let us know. Drop us a line. We would love to incorporate that into our teaching and our preaching. We appreciate you and thank you.